Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, a production of catholicculture.org and under the patronage of St. John Henry Newman. Today's reading, Worship, a Preparation for Christ's Coming, found in Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 5, written by St. John Henry Newman, narrated by James T. Majewski. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Isaiah 33, 17 Year after year as it passes brings us the same warnings again and again, and none perhaps more impressive than those with which it comes to us at this season. The very frost and cold, Rain and gloom which now befall us forebode the last dreary days of the world, and in religious hearts raise the thought of them. The year is worn out. Spring, summer, autumn, each in turn have brought their gifts and done their utmost, but they are over, and the end is come. All is past and gone. All has failed. All has sated. We are tired of the past. We would not have the seasons longer, and the austere weather which succeeds, though ungrateful to the body, is in tone with our feelings and acceptable. Such is the frame of mind which befits the end of the year, and such the frame of mind which comes alike on good and bad at the end of life. The days have come in which they have no pleasure, yet they would hardly be young again, could they be so by wishing it. Life is well enough in its way, but it does not satisfy. Thus the soul is cast forward upon the future, and in proportion as its conscience is clear and its perception keen and true, does it rejoice solemnly that the night is far spent, the day is at hand, that there are new heavens and a new earth to come, though the former are failing. Nay, rather that, because they are failing, it will soon see the king in his beauty and behold the land which is very far off. These are feelings for holy men, in winter and in age, waiting, in some dejection perhaps, but with comfort on the whole, and calmly though earnestly, for the advent of Christ. And such too are the feelings with which we now come before him in prayer day by day. The season is chill and dark, and the breath of the morning is damp and worshippers are few. But all this befits those who are by profession penitents and mourners, watchers and pilgrims. More dear to them that loneliness, more cheerful that severity, and more bright that gloom, than all those aids and appliances of luxury by which men nowadays attempt to make prayer less disagreeable to them. True faith does not covet comforts. It only complains when it is forbidden to kneel, when it reclines upon cushions, is protected by curtains and encompassed by warmth. Its only hardship is to be hindered or to be ridiculed when it would place itself as a sinner before its judge. They who realize that awful day when they shall see him face to face, whose eyes are as a flame of fire, will as little bargain to pray pleasantly now as they will think of doing so then. One year goes and then another, but the same mornings recur. The frost or the rain comes again. The earth is stripped of its brightness. There is nothing to rejoice in. And then, amid this unprofitableness of earth and sky, the well-known words return. The prophet Isaiah is read. The same epistle and gospel, bidding us awake out of sleep and welcome him that cometh in the name of the Lord. The same collects, beseeching him to prepare for us judgment. O blessed they who obey these warning voices and look out for him whom they have not seen, because they love his appearing. We cannot have fitter reflections at this season than those which I have entered upon. What may be the destiny of other orders of beings we know not, but this we know to be our own fearful lot, that before us lies a time when we must have the sight of our Maker and Lord face to face. We know not what is reserved for other beings. There may be some which, knowing nothing of their Maker, are never to be brought before Him. 
For what we can tell, this may be the case with the brute creation. It may be the law of their nature that they should live and die, or live on an indefinite period upon the very outskirts of his government, sustained by him but never permitted to know or approach him. But this is not our case. We are destined to come before him, nay, and to come before him in judgment, and that on our first meeting, and that suddenly. We are not merely to be rewarded or punished. We are to be judged. Recompense is to come upon our actions, not by a mere general provision or course of nature as it does at present, but from the lawgiver himself in person. We have to stand before his righteous presence, and that one by one. One by one we shall have to endure his holy and searching eye. At present, we are in a world of shadows. What we see is not substantial. Suddenly, it will be rent in twain and vanish away, and our Maker will appear. And then, I say, that first appearance will be nothing less than a personal intercourse between the Creator and every creature. He will look on us while we look on Him. I need hardly quote any of the numerous passages of Scripture which tell us this by way of proof, but it may impress the truth of it upon our hearts to do so. We are told then, expressly, that good and bad shall see God. On the one hand, Holy Job says, Though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. On the other hand, unrighteous Balaam says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Christ says to his disciples, Look up, and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And to his enemies, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man, sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. And it is said generally of all men on the one hand, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And on the other, When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Again, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And again, they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. As they see him, so will he see them, for his coming will be to judge them. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, says St. Paul. Again, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And again, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Such is our first meeting with our God, and I say, it will be as sudden as it is intimate. Yourselves know perfectly, says St. Paul, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, for when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. This is said of the wicked. Elsewhere he is said to surprise good as well as bad. While the bridegroom tarried, the wise and foolish virgins all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now, when this state of the case, the prospect which lies before us, is brought home to our thoughts, surely it is one which will lead us anxiously to ask, Is this all that we are told, all that is allowed to us or done for us? Do we know only this, that all is dark now and all will be light then, that now God is hidden and one day will be revealed, that we are in a world of sense and are to be in a world of spirits, 
for surely it is our plain wisdom, our bounden duty, to prepare for this great change. And if so, are any directions, hints, or rules given us how we are to prepare? Prepare to meet thy God, go ye out to meet him, is the dictate of natural reason as well as of inspiration. But how is this to be? Now observe that it is scarcely a sufficient answer to this question to say that we must strive to obey him, and so to approve ourselves to him. This indeed might be enough, were reward and punishment to follow in the mere way of nature, as they do in this world. But, when we come steadily to consider the matter, appearing before God and dwelling in his presence is a very different thing from being merely subjected to a system of moral laws, and would seem to require another preparation, a special preparation of thought and affection, such as will enable us to endure his countenance and to hold communion with him as we ought. Nay, and, it may be, a preparation of the soul itself for his presence, just as the bodily eye must be exercised in order to bear the full light of day, or the bodily frame in order to bear exposure to the air. But, whether or not this be safe reasoning, Scripture precludes the necessity of it by telling us that the gospel covenant is intended, among its other purposes, to prepare us for this future glorious and wonderful destiny the sight of God, a destiny which, if not most glorious, will be most terrible. And in the worship and service of Almighty God, which Christ and his apostles have left to us, we are vouchsafed means, both moral and mystical, of approaching God and gradually learning to bear the sight of him. This, indeed, is the most momentous reason for religious worship, as far as we have grounds for considering it a true one. Men sometimes ask, why need they profess religion? Why need they go to church? Why need they observe certain rites and ceremonies? Why need they watch, pray, fast and meditate? Why is it not enough to be just, honest, sober, benevolent and otherwise virtuous? Is not this the true and real worship of God? Is not activity in mind and conduct the most acceptable way of approaching Him? How can they please him by submitting to certain religious forms and taking part in certain religious acts? Or if they must do so, why may they not choose their own? Why must they come to church for them? Why must they be partakers in what the church calls sacraments? I answer, they must do so, first of all and especially, because God tells them so to do. But besides this, I observe that we see this plain reason why, that they are one day to change their state of being. They are not to be here forever. Direct intercourse with God on their part now, prayer and the like, may be necessary to their meeting Him suitably hereafter. And direct intercourse on His part with them, or what we call sacramental communion, may be necessary in some incomprehensible way even for preparing their very nature to bear the sight of him. Let us then take this view of religious service. It is going out to meet the bridegroom, who, if not seen in his beauty, will appear in consuming fire. Besides its other momentous reasons, it is a preparation for an awful event which shall one day be. What it would be to meet Christ at once without preparation we may learn from what happened even to the apostles when his glory was suddenly manifested to them. St. Peter said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And St. John, when he saw him, fell at his feet as dead. This being the case, it is certainly most merciful in God to vouchsafe to us the means of preparation and such means as he has actually appointed. When Moses came down from the mount and the people were dazzled at his countenance, he put a veil over it. That veil is so far removed in the gospel that we are in a state of preparation for its being altogether removed. We are with Moses in the mount so far that we have a sight of God. We are with the people beneath it so far that Christ does not visibly show himself. He has put a veil on and he sits among us silently and secretly.
When we approach Him, we know it only by faith, and when He manifests Himself to us, it is without our being able to realize to ourselves that manifestation. Such, then, is the spirit in which we should come to all His ordinances, considering them as anticipations and first fruits of that sight of Him which one day must be. When we kneel down in prayer in private, let us think to ourselves, Thus shall I one day kneel down before His very footstool, in this flesh and this blood of mine, and He will be seated over against me, in flesh and blood also, though divine. I come with the thought of that awful hour before me. I come to confess my sin to Him now, that He may pardon it then. And I say, O Lord, holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment, deliver us, O Lord. Again, when we come to church, then let us say, The day will be when I shall see Christ surrounded by His holy angels. I shall be brought into that blessed company in which all will be pure, all bright. I come then to learn to endure the sight of the Holy One and His servants, to nerve myself for a vision which is fearful before it is ecstatic, and which they only enjoy whom it does not consume. When men in this world have to undergo any great thing, they prepare themselves beforehand by thinking often of it, and they call this making up their mind. Any unusual trial they thus make familiar to them. Courage is a necessary step in gaining certain goods, and courage is gained by steady thought. Children are scared and close their eyes at the vision of some mighty warrior or glorious king, and when Daniel saw the angel, like St. John, his comeliness was turned in him into corruption, and he retained no strength. I come then to church, because I am an heir of heaven. It is my desire and hope one day to take possession of my inheritance, and I come to make myself ready for it, and I would not see heaven yet, for I could not bear to see it. I am allowed to be in it without seeing it, that I may learn to see it, and by psalm and sacred song, by confession and by praise, I learn my part. And what is true of the ordinary services of religion, public and private, holds in a still higher, or rather in a special way, as regards the sacramental ordinances of the Church. In these is manifested, in greater or less degree according to the measure of each, that incarnate Savior, who is one day to be our judge, and who is enabling us to bear His presence then, by imparting it to us in measure now. A thick black veil is spread between this world and the next. We mortal men range up and down it, to and fro, and see nothing. There is no access through it into the next world. In the gospel, this veil is not removed. It remains. But every now and then, marvelous disclosures are made to us of what is behind it. At times we seem to catch a glimpse of a form which we shall hereafter see face to face. We approach, and in spite of the darkness, our hands or our head, or our brow or our lips, become, as it were, sensible of the contact of something more than earthly. We know not where we are, but we have been bathing in water, and a voice tells us that it is blood, or we have a mark signed upon our foreheads, and it spake of Calvary, or we recollect a hand laid upon our heads, and surely it had the print of nails in it, and resembled his who with a touch gave sight to the blind and raised the dead. Or we have been eating and drinking, and it was not a dream, surely, that one fed us from his wounded side and renewed our nature by the heavenly meat he gave. Thus, in many ways, he who is judged to us prepares us to be judged. He who is to glorify us prepares us to be glorified, that he may not take us unawares, but that when the voice of the archangel sounds, and we are called to meet the bridegroom, we may be ready. Now consider what light these reflections throw upon some remarkable texts in the epistle to the Hebrews. If we have in the gospel this supernatural approach to God into the next world, 
no wonder that St. Paul calls it an enlightening, a tasting of the heavenly gift, a being made partaker of the Holy Ghost, a tasting of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. No wonder, too, that utter apostasy after receiving it should be so utterly hopeless, and that in consequence any profanation of it, any sinning against it, should be so perilous in proportion to its degree. If he who is to be our judge condescend here to manifest himself to us, surely if that privilege does not fit us for his future glory, it does but prepare us for his wrath. And what I have said concerning ordinances applies still more fully to holy seasons, which include in them the celebration of many ordinances. They are times when we may humbly expect a larger grace, because they invite us especially to the means of grace. This, in particular, is a time for purification of every kind. When Almighty God was to descend upon Mount Sinai, Moses was told to sanctify the people and bid them wash their clothes and to set bounds to them round about. Much more is this a season for cleansing ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. A season for chastened hearts and religious eyes, for severe thoughts and austere resolves and charitable deeds. A season for remembering what we are and what we shall be. Let us go out to meet him with contrite and expectant hearts, and though he delays his coming, Let us watch for him in the cold and dreariness which must one day have an end. Attend his summons we must, at any rate, when he strips us of the body. Let us anticipate, by a voluntary act, what will one day come on us of necessity. Let us wait for him solemnly, fearfully, hopefully, patiently, obediently. Let us be resigned to his will, while active in good works. Let us pray him ever to remember us when he cometh in his kingdom, to remember all our friends, to remember our enemies, and to visit us according to his mercy here, that he may reward us according to his righteousness hereafter. This has been Worship, a preparation for Christ's coming, found in Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 5, written by St. John Henry Newman, narrated by James T. Majewski, production copyright 2019 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is brought to you by catholicculture.org and made possible by listener support. To donate, please visit catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. That's catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio.